Chapter 14 of The Ghost, A Modern Fantasy by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 14. The Villa. It seemed to be my duty to tell Rosa, of course with all possible circumspection, that, despite a general impression to the contrary, Lord Clarenceau was still alive. His lordship's reasons for effacing himself and so completely deceiving his friends and the world I naturally could not divine. But I knew that such things had happened before, and also I gathered that he was a man who would hesitate at no caprice, however extravagant, once it had suggested itself to him as expedient for the satisfaction of his singular nature. A light broke in upon me. Aureska must have been aware that Lord Clarenceau was alive. That must have been part of Aureska's secret, but only part. I felt somehow that I was on the verge of some tragical discovery which might vitally affect not only my own existence, but that of others. I saw Rosa on the morning after my interview with Yvette. She was in perfect health and moderately good spirits, and she invited me to dine with her that evening. I will tell her after dinner, I said to myself. The project of telling her seemed more difficult as it approached. She said, that she had arranged by telephone for another rehearsal at the Opera Comique at three o'clock, but she did not invite me to accompany her. I spent the afternoon at the Sorbonne, where I had some acquaintances, and, after calling at my hotel, the little Hotel de Portugal in the Rue Croix des Petitions, to dress, I drove in a fiacre to the Rue de Rivoli. I had carefully considered how best in conversation I might lead Rosa to the subject of Lord Clarenceau, and had arranged a little plan. Decidedly, I did not anticipate the interview with unmixed pleasure, but, as I have said, I felt bound to inform her that her former lover's death was a fiction. My suit might be doomed thereby to failure, I had no right to expect otherwise, but if it should succeed and I had kept silence on this point, I should have played the part of a, well, of a man of three letters. Mademoiselle is not at home, said the servant. Not at home, but I am dining with her, my friend. Mademoiselle has been called away suddenly, and she has left a note for Monsieur. Will Monsieur give himself the trouble to come into the salon? The note ran thus. Dear friend, a thousand excuses, but the enclosed will explain. I felt that I must go, and go instantly. She might die before I arrived. Will you call early tomorrow? Your grateful Rosa. And this was the enclosure written in French. Vela des Hortensias, Routier, Pantin, Paris. Mademoiselle, I am dying. I have wronged you deeply, and I dare not die without your forgiveness. Prove to me that you have a great heart by coming to my bedside and telling me that you accept my repentance. The bearer will conduct you. Carlotta Deschamps. What time did Mademoiselle leave? I inquired. In less than a quarter of an hour ago, was the reply. Who brought the note to her? A man, monsieur. Mademoiselle accompanied him in a cab. With a velocity which must have startled the grave and leisurely servant, I precipitated myself out of the house and back into the fiacre, which happily had not gone away. I told the cabman to drive to my hotel at his best speed. To me, Deschamps' letter was in the highest degree suspicious. Rosa, of course, with the simplicity of a heart incapable of any baseness, had accepted it in perfect faith. But I remember the words of Yvette, uttered in all solemnity. She is dangerous. You must take care. Further, I observed that the handwriting of this strange and dramatic missive was remarkably firm and regular for a dying woman, and that the composition showed a certain calculated effectiveness. I feared allure. Instinctively, I knew Deschamps to be one of those women who, driven by the goad of passionate feeling, will proceed to any length content to postpone reflection till afterwards, when the irremediable has happened. By chance, I was slightly acquainted with the remote and sinister suburb where lay the Villa des Ordencias. I knew that at night it possessed a peculiar reputation, and my surmise was that Rosa had been decoyed thither with some evil intent. Arrived at my hotel, I unearthed my revolver and put it in my pocket. Nothing might occur. On the other hand, everything might occur and it was only prudent to be prepared. Dwelling on this thought, I also took the little jewelled dagger which Rosa had given to Sir Cyril Smart at the historic reception of my cousin Sullivan's. 
In the hall of the hotel, I looked at the plan of Paris. Certainly, Bantin seemed to be a very long way off. The route to it from the centre of the city, that is to say, the Place de l'Opera, followed the Rue Lafayette, which is the longest straight thoroughfare in Paris, and then the Rue d'Alemiane, which is a continuation in the same direction of the Rue Lafayette. The suburb lay without the fortifications. The Rue Thiers, every Parisian suburb has its Rue Thiers, was about half a mile past the barrier on the right. I asked the aged woman who fulfils the functions of hall porter at the Hotel de Portugal whether a cab would take me to Pantin. Pantin, she repeated, as she might have said, Timbuktu. And she called the proprietor. The proprietor also said, Pantin, as he might have said, Timbuktu, and advised me to take the steam tram which starts from behind the opera to let that carry me as far as it would, and then arrived in those distant regions either to find a cab or to walk the remainder of the distance. So armed, I issued forth, and drove to the tram, and placed myself on the top of the tram. And the tram, after much tooting of horns, set out. Through kilometre after kilometre of gaslit, clattering monotony, that immense and deafening conveyance took me. There were cafes everywhere, thickly strewn on both sides of the way, at first large and lofty and richly decorated with vast glazed facades, and manned by waiters in black and white then gradually growing smaller and less busy. The black and white waiters gave place to men in blouses, and men in blouses gave place to women and girls, short, fat women and girls who gossiped among themselves and to customers. Once we passed a cafe quite deserted, save for the waiter and the waitress, who sat, head on arms, side by side, over a table, asleep. Then the tram stopped finally, having covered about three miles. There was no sign of a cab. I proceeded on foot. The shops got smaller and dingier. They were filled, apparently, by the families of the proprietors. At length I crossed over a canal, the dreadful quarter of La Villette, and here the street widened out to an immense width, and it was silent and forlorn under the gas lamps. I hurried under railway bridges, and I saw in the distance great shunting yards looking grim in their blue hazes of electric light. Then came the city barrier and the octroi, and still the street stretched in front of me, darker now, more mischievous, more obscure. I was in Bantin. At last I descried the white and blue sign of the routier. I stood alone in the shadow of the high forbidding houses. All seemed strange and fearsome. Certainly this might still be called Paris, but it was not the Paris known to Englishmen. It was the Paris of Zola, and Zola in a Balzacian mood. I turned into the Rue Thiers, and at once the high forbidding houses ceased, and small detached villas, such as would be found in thousands round the shabby skirts of Paris, took their place. The Villa des Hortensias, clearly labelled, was nearly at the far end of the funereal street. It was rather larger than its fellows, and comprised three stories, with a small garden in front, and a vast grill with a big bell, such as Parisians love when they have passed the confines of the city after dispensed with the security of a concierge. The grill was ajar. They entered the garden, having made sure that the bell would not sound. The façade of the house showed no light whatever. A double stone stairway of four steps led to the front door. I went up the steps and was about to knock, when the idea flashed across my mind. Suppose that Deschamps is really dying. How am I to explain my presence here? I am not the guardian of Rosa, and she may resent being tracked across Paris by a young man with no claim to watch her actions. Nevertheless, in an expedition of this nature one must accept risks, and therefore I knocked gently. There was no reply to the summons, and I was cogitating upon my next move when, happening to press against the door with my hand, I discovered that it was not latched. Without weighing consequences, I quietly opened it, and with infinite caution stepped into the hall, and pushed the door to. I did not latch it, lest I might need to make a sudden exit. Unfamiliar knobs and springs are apt to be troublesome when one is in a hurry. I was now fairly in the house, but the darkness was blacker than the pit, and I did not care to strike a match. I felt my way along by the wall till I came to a door on the left. It was locked. A little further was another door, also locked. 
I listened intently, for I fancied I could hear a faint murmur of voices, but I was not sure. Then I startled myself by stepping on nothing. I was at the head of a flight of stone steps. Down below I could distinguish an almost imperceptible glimmer of light. I'm in for it. Here goes, I reflected, and I crept down the steps one by one, and in due course reached to the bottom. To the left was a doorway through which came the glimmer of light. Passing through the doorway, I came into a room with a stone floor. The light, which was no stronger than the very earliest intimation of a winter's dawn, seemed to issue in a most unusual way from the far corner of this apartment near the ceiling. I directed my course towards it, and in the trance it made violent contact with some metallic object, which proved to be an upright iron shaft, perhaps three inches in diameter, running from floor to ceiling. Surely, I thought, this is the queerest room I was ever in. Circumnavigating the pillar, I reached the desired corner and stood under the feeble source of light. I could see now that in this corner the ceiling was higher than elsewhere, and that the light shone dimly from a perpendicular pane of glass which joined the two levels of the ceiling. I also saw that there was a ledge about two feet from the floor, upon which a man would stand in order to look through the pane. I climbed onto the ledge, and I looked. To my astonishment I had a full view of a large apartment, my head being even with the floor of that apartment. Lying on a couch was a woman, the woman who had accosted me on Dover Pier, Carlotta Deschamps, in fact. By her side, facing her in her chair, was Rosetta Rosa. I could hear nothing, but by the movement of their lips I knew that these two were talking. Rosa's face was full of pity. As for Deschamps, her coarse features were inscrutable. She had a certain pallor, but it was impossible to judge whether she was ill or well. I scarcely began to observe the two women when I caught the sound of footsteps on the stone stair. The footsteps approached. They entered the room where I was. I made no sound. Without any hesitation, the footsteps arrived at my corner, and a pair of hands touched my legs. Then I knew it was time to act. Jumping down from the ledge, I clasped the intruder by the head, and we rolled over together, struggling. But he was a short man, apparently stiff in the limbs, and in ten seconds or thereabouts I had him flat on his back and my hand at his throat. Don't move, I advised him. In that faint light I could not see him, so I struck a match and held it over the man's face. We gazed at each other, breathing heavily. Good God! the man exclaimed. It was Sir Cyril Smart. End of chapter 14